thanks for joining us today. It's our first uh, CDI Live Security Briefing for 2022. We're excited about uh, what's ahead of us. Today's briefing is packed. We've got a lot of information, obviously, for several reasons. It's, it's, it's been a while since we were together and a lot going on and, and um, lot to talk about. So I'll be brief. We're, we're going to look at really at three things this morning, uh, really around the attacks. We'll look at some new attacks. We'll look at some updates on previous attacks, and then we'll t look at a few takedowns. Uh, it's always good to see uh, the, the, the efforts going on to, uh, to remove some of the threats. And then secondly, we'll look at the log 4J. There's a lot of conversation around that. We'll really uh, break that down and, and look at several aspects of the log 4J. And then finally, we'll, we'll do a little preview of the threat landscape uh, for 2022. So if you're new to, to the briefing, uh, again, welcome. Uh, my name is Tim Martin. I'm Chief Development Officer with Pillar, and, and I'll be your facilitator uh, through the session. But just as a qu quick background, uh, we launched Cyber Defense Intelligence Initiative a year ago as a new forum for information sharing and to give you more actionable insight to help you simplify cyber. Uh, our CDI team collects intel based on what we're seeing in the trenches every day, and we help you interpret it from a CISO's perspective based on our 30 plus years of information security experience. So a couple of things to note as, as, we're, as we're working through uh, the information today is if you have questions, submit your questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, again, the Q&A button is important. The chat uh, feature is not working. So submit your questions there. And also just a note, we'll be sharing a recording uh, post session. So uh, for people who have attending, so you'll be able to, to, to go back through it, rewatch it, review it. And if you can share that with, with others in your organization as well. So again, welcome. We're excited about today. So let's go ahead and dive in. Um, our, our presenters today, Skeet Spillane, uh, you've all seen him over the last year. Uh, he's our CEO and CISO uh, for Pillar, uh, also serves as a VCSO for organizations across the U.S. And a new face for us today, one of our new lead engineers, Kenneth Spann. So, Kenneth, welcome to uh, to the briefing, and I will look forward to uh, your thoughts and, and feedback. So, Skeet, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of the way. I'm going to kick it off, kind of hand it to you. Fantastic. Thanks, Tim. Uh, yeah, and we're going to kind of jump in today, and actually, we're going to reverse this a little bit, and I'm going to hand it over to Kenneth to really dive in on the Log4j update. But then we're going to talk about the new attacks we've seen this month. It's been actually a busy month. Um, and then talk a little bit about the current threats and vulnerabilities and trends we're seeing. We'll talk, as Tim said, about some positive moments on the takedowns, and then we'll really go into some of the trends we expect to see continue throughout 2022 or some of the new ones we expect to pop up. Uh, so, Kenneth, I'm going to hand it over to you and let you kind of drive forward here for uh, the Log4j update, which was actually everyone in security and IT's Christmas present right before the holidays. So everyone got to spend time diving into that. So go ahead and uh, take it from there. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Ski. Log4j, as far as the updates for Log4j for 2022, the big ones that we had to identify was what is it? but also the problems that we're having with this. This can be from many different perspectives. This could be from anything internal, but also from external. Uh, what is our supply chain? What about our third-party vendors? We also discovered new ways to remediate the vulnerability, the new ways to discover the vulnerability that's inside of your organization. This presents several different challenges from how do we use the vulnerability scanner but also something as far as an S-bomb, which we'll talk about on the next page. Then how to defend it and how do we discuss it with third-party vendors going forward. Uh, the big ones for this year has been to make sure we're leveraging the CISO relationships. Uh, our CISO is going to be the ones that are going to be the public face for a lot of these vulnerabilities uh, and the general knowledge expert. I understand your environment. What we mean by that is I understand everywhere that your risk uh, is potentially vulnerable. Uh, your vulnerability is, is a potential risk. Uh, this could be for anything from the external side, from your websites, but also from internal perspective. A lot of the web, a lot of applications and a lot of laptops and servers run Java and therefore could be susceptible to this type of attack. We live in an environment where it's not just an internal perspective, it's not just an internal IT risk, but also any third party vendors. So when we're talking about uh, marketing applications uh, that were out or the uh, financial side of it for uh, 
tracking for metrics. These could all have the potential risk of log for j When I mentioned an S bomb, this is software beer bill of materials. Several applications can go through and identify any third party applications or containers or components that are not necessarily an internal developed application. Log4j would be one of these. It will go through and such as Psy PsyOps or Black Duck or Checkmarks will go through, validate any components that are in an application, and then provide you the information as far as the vulnerabilities, but also the versioning for said component. The big one about this is being able to understand and identify the risk in your environment. Make sure we're staying abreast with new threats and intelligence. CDI is a great example of this and joining in on these because we can we go through and we cherry pick the top information that you need to be aware of for the next month or for, in this case, 2022. Ensure that all testing is being conducted from internal, but also from an external perspective. It is not only a great practice to do your own vulnerability assessments, but it is also a great practice to make sure that we're doing a third-party assessment to checks and balances. So whenever we're talking about our third-party vendors, we want to make sure we have an open communication and they're advising us when their vulnerabilities are remediated. This provides, this takes a client or a vendor from a vendor to a partnership relationship whenever we have trust in the information that they're providing. The best practice is to notify your customers as we just discussed. We want to make sure that everybody understands that we're not only cautious of our vulnerabilities that we potentially present, but we are also taking a leadership in remediating any vulnerabilities that we do have. Here at Pillar Technologies, we want to make sure that you understand that we uh, we value your business, we value the knowledge, and we have due diligence in making sure that we can remediate any and all vulnerabilities presented into your environment. Oops, thanks. I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Kenneth. Yeah, it was an interesting, uh, interesting month because the way the Log4j vulnerability developed you know it was first it was in one version then it became a second version and actually if you applied the patch from one version it actually <coughs> accelerated the exploit of the second version and then you had to actually find out that there's a third version that needed to be patched and you know i think for me what it, a couple of things it showed one was you know this can happen in a lot of different places. It really is a supply chain attack, but this one was really focused on the open source side of the equation. You know, so who's responsible for fixing this when it's in a public domain and it's a shared project where you actually have volunteers who are responsible for putting their hands on the keyboard to fix it. So, you know, I mean, it's, it was a unique scenario. And I think uh, some of the things we saw was the organizations that were successful at getting in front of it were the ones who had a strong incident response capability and they were able to really dive in and say, okay, where do we have log4j? Because, you know, as a tool, it's deployed in a lot of places, like you said, Kenneth, you know, it could be out on a laptop, it could be on an application uh, riding above a server, it could be down on the server itself. So there were lots of places where the, the logging tool for Java was actually there and enabled and may or may not have been updated. So, you know, it was a big effort to try and get everyone's arms around this and move it forward. And, you know, I, I think when we think about this, not just from an open source supply chain perspective, but also just in general, you know, we see the, the importance of trust but verify. We have to run testing. We have to not only test our internal applications and have third party, like you said, whether it's Barracode or check marks or other tools that are really diving in and looking for vulnerabilities that may exist. And in this case, it's tough because it was kind of a zero day type of scenario there where the exploits were popping at us very quickly. But <clears throat> we need to be make sure, making sure that we're testing, but then we're also should be testing anything we put in our environment. Don't trust the vendors. Yes, we go roll back to last year, with solar winds, you know, could we have picked that up if we were running testing of our own environments and making sure that we're identifying where there may be potential risks of any tool of our in our environment? And you know, I think 
we need to be better as a industry at really understanding how and how to be effective at testing some of these applications as they're coming into our environment. And I agree with you on the uh, SBOM approach, you know, that that bill of materials will really help to know quickly where you actually have this deployed and in what applications and where it sits. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot of lessons we're going to learn out of this, but, uh, it, it, it was kind of painful. And fortunately, at this point, we haven't seen any definitive breaches as a result of it. However, I fully expect that this is one that's going to go on for quite some time and f think that we will see uh, this, you know, being exploited by the APT groups, especially out of China. We've already seen some activity from them trying to test some uh, <clears throat> some of these exploits and once they're in they're going to lurk and they're just going to leverage this as a a point of entry but also be a potential lateral move within organizations who haven't got in front of it and patched effectively yes and definitely whenever we're talking to clients to <laughs> make sure we're doing an assessment is java even needed uh, in your environment uh, uh, this should be a a best practice that we're taking for any application we're introducing <clears throat> into our environment right Absolutely, you know, and, and and the good news is is on Pillar Technologies website we do have a blog that covers all of the vulnerabilities around Log4j, but also the remediation steps as well as discovery in your environment, different queries we can run, as well as uh, one of our partner uh, firms that we work with, uh, a uh, configuration management tool out of Israel, uh, Gitpol not only has the ability to discover it, but also one button remediation of the log4j. So it's something to think about uh, as you're looking at how do you manage the configurations or misconfigurations of your endpoints out there. Tools like Gitpol can absolutely help uh, manage that and be a force multiplier for your environment. Absolutely, and being able to provide a evidence collection for any of <coughs> your uh, compliance that you might have. Yep, absolutely. Well, thank you, Kenneth. Um, we'll move on now into kind of new attacks that we've seen this month. Um, one big one that we saw this month was uh, Hellman Worldwide, which is a very large logistics organization, um, had an attack and unfortunately negotiations with the, uh, the threat actors went sideways and they published about 70 gigabytes of their information out there and they are still continuing to uh, <coughs> resolve this uh, ransomware incident. And it appears that all of this may have started with uh, a business email compromise. So once again, you know, really stay focused on those protection uh, controls on the front end, making sure that those don't enter your environment, whether it's multi-factor or secure mail gateways, and that you're defanging and filtering a lot of these uh, emails that before they ever get into your environment, and that you're forcing good password policy to make sure that people are changing these out, they're not reusing, and they're updating these as they go. Uh, Maryland Department of Health was hit with ransomware as well. Um, we also saw Red Cross uh, absolutely pleading with the threat actors uh, to not release uh, the information of 515,000 uh, uh, victims' data. Uh, they attacked the Red Cross, which, you know, it, it's one of those moments that just really says what what the level of ethics and type of people that we're dealing with here. And, uh, you know, they went after these uh, very vulnerable people and uh, are threatening to release their information. So, you know, it can happen to anyone. Uh, there's also a four-year-old <laughs> Azure uh, application bug that actually was identified, which was allowing uh, the attackers to go back in and see uh, code that was developed across various types of uh, tools that were stored in the Azure uh, repository, and they were able to see the code and understand kind of how some of these applications are working. So, you know, that that's, that's a potential future issue coming down the pipe as well. Uh, there was another T-Mobile breach. Uh, they continue to have problems over the last year. Uh, this was smaller in nature, but uh, definitely not what they wanted to hear from their environment. You know, I think this one was uh, <coughs> 
not near on the order of the last one, which I think had 50 million users involved in it. But, uh, you know, as a, uh, as an organization, you'd never want to have a follow-up attack right after you've had a recent one. And then uh, the Portuguese media uh, company, Impreza, was actually taken down by ransomware on New Year's Day. They were actually taken out, um, and it took their uh, a lot of their content offline. So you know, it's uh, the um, the threat actor in this one is suspected to be Lapsus. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of these ransomware as a service uh, gangs where they're actually developing this and this ransomware as a service will continue to be a major player. Um, they're now even really starting to come together with the access brokers. So the access brokers are giving them initial access in so that the ransomware can be actually even more effective. Um, and then they're selling this code out and people are just literally buying it as a black box service on the dark web. Um, so we'll, we'll have to continue watching for that and see if we can, uh, you know, identify any new ways other than the traditional methods of uh, being quick to respond. One of the recommendations we're making with our clients is develop uh, a uh, ransomware rapid insertion team. Uh, one of the challenges we see with ransomware is that it moves so quickly through the organizations that uh, if you're not on top of it quickly, the impact can grow exponentially in the first few minutes. Um, so having a team that is ready to respond and having your uh, internal teams from the help desk on prepared to escalate and hit the red button uh, when they see this so you can activate this team to do the isolation and containment and sh stop the lateral movement of these uh, ransomware services before they can actually damage other parts of your network are, are going to be very important um, in addition to all of the traditional uh, uh, mechanisms, you know, DLP, the multi-factor, the uh, network segmentation. So, you know, we want to continue to do that, but we also want to find new ways to actually uh, improve our responsiveness. Uh, we also saw Sotheby's actually uh, have a uh, supply chain attack uh, with the injection of uh, malicious skimmers. We saw Broward County with 1.3 patient records breached. Um, and an interesting note, uh, the state of New York actually identified 17 companies that had 1.1 million uh, customer uh, credentials identified on the dark web. So they have notified these companies. But, you know, it reminds us that credential stuffing is continually a challenge. And then <coughs> Flexbook actually had... Uh, uh, 3.7 million of their records actually dumped onto one of the uh, shame sites out on the dark web. So, you know, as we <laughs> continue down this path, we see this double extortion type of attack playing out day after day, where it's not just enough that you're not just protecting from the loss of use of a file. A lot of those files are exfiltrated through the command and control structure out to dark web share sites and they have your information. So the second you get hit by some of these ransomware, you're actually in a breach mode at that point because your data is out there and someone else has it. So it needs to be treated as such as well. And we need to look at the mechanisms to prevent that exfiltration as well, whether it's data loss prevention or zero trust to isolate a machine quicker or other types of mechanisms, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, Kenneth, I'm going to hand this back over to you real quickly on the current threats because we have one that developed over the last 24 hours and Kenneth was the first one on our team to kind of really identify it. And I'll let you talk a little bit about the sonic wall uh, vulnerability that was identified. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, the sonic wall SMA vulnerability, uh, it is particular to certain applications uh, within the sonic wall infrastructure, but specifically the versions. Uh, the full list is on our webpage. But the currently, there's no indicators of compromise for this. This is a true zero day for SonicWall. The big one is, is just this typical things that we can always suggest, which is to reset your password for anything and everything when it comes to SonicWall. This could be your uh, 
main support page and support portal, but also you obviously your external side of your sonic wall. Yeah. And, you know, so many, the challenge with a sonic wall attack is that their target market tend to be organizations that don't necessarily have <laughs> the, the full blown team. So, you know, it, absolutely. The small and medium, medium size is, is a great example of that. And there's some good resources out there talking about some thoughts of what to do. We posted some information on our website, but uh, CISA also has some information out there. Um, and, you know, the, the challenge is there are some CVEs that you can patch, but we, you know, the, the other is it's not fully remediating this. We need to monitor going forward and understand what type of activity is going on within these applications within the Sonic Wall. <laughs> to make sure you're not a victim of that. Um, and Blister, we saw, we were seeing actually uh, the use of it. Blister is a malware platform uh, that is out there that is actually uh, using legitimized uh, codes signed uh, using valid certificates to actually bypass security controls. So, you know, there, there's a lot of information out there. Once in, it actually leverages Cobalt Strike. Um, and it's deploying uh, Bitrat, which is a uh, remote access Trojan, which allows them to do command and control outside into your network. So something to watch out for there. ILO bleed um, is another attack. Uh, it's a data wiper type of attack, and it's using the uh, lights out capability of uh, the HP Enterprise uh, tool set. Uh, there are some uh, CVEs out there and some patches out there. So making sure you're first patch it if you need it. But uh, also, if you don't need ILO and you're not running a lights out organization, turn it off. Yeah, there, there's no reason to have something. It's in, purposely intended to give remote access. And if they can violate that, they have direct <coughs> hands into your environment. Uh, the Uber flaw uh, that was identified allowed... Uh, anyone to send unauthorized emails using a uber.com uh, extension, domain extension on their email. So every all the emails looked uh, legitimate. So that's something to pay attention to in your log, seeing if you're seeing any uber.com type of emails coming through. Um, Microsoft continues to struggle with their e-signature um, issues. This developed a couple of months ago when we were talking about the uh, this particular exploit, but it continues to develop. Uh, they also weaponized uh, the Google Docs comment uh, as part of a phishing campaign, which allowed them to reach at, into the user, uh, the Google users directly through the comments feature on the uh, Google Docs. So um, something to watch out for there. I know Google's on top of patching that However, it's something to make your users aware of that they, they could actually be reached out to through the comments and don't trust <coughs> anything on its face. Make sure that they're questioning all these pieces. It comes back to developing a culture of healthy paranoia. Get your users to understand that anything is a potential threat. Um, we also uh, are seeing an increase in attacks on the VMware platform. Uh, there was a vulnerability out there which is allowing uh, takeover of the hypervisors, and uh, there are actual CV, uh, there are patches out there for this, um, but it's something for your infrastructure administrators to watch out for in larger environments to make sure that uh, you're not seeing an, a, any abnormal activities. So watch for things in your uh, in your logs, in your sims that may indicate that there's uh, abnormal activity around the actual hypervisors themselves. Uh, continuing on, we actually see more uh, cache poisoning. Uh, DOS attacks are on the rise. We're seeing a lot of uh, denial of service attacks, um, <coughs> both direct and distributed. Um, so now we're seeing them turning towards cloud apps. Uh, we also saw that um, the FBI is warning specifically about uh, Fin7, the threat actor, uh, targeting uh, ransomware and uh, really using the bad USB uh, malware to distribute it. So something to watch out for there. There's a uh, actual uh, 
<coughs> alert out on the uh, FBI and CISA sites on that one as well. We're seeing targets on uh, the ICS uh, systems where they're trying to de deploy spyware um, and really targeting the ins uh, the uh, control systems. Uh, this we expect to see this, and we'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing in 2022. But critical infrastructure and uh, the OT networks are going to be under assault. So if you have operating technology networks, uh, really pay attention. You know, we, we've, we've lost that traditional air gap between IT and OT, and it's creating some real challenges there. Uh, so make sure you pay attention. And then also, this is just a generic one. Lots of organizations use box.com. Uh, there is a way to bypass the MFA on this. Uh, there is a way to reconfigure this so that this does not happen. Um, but uh, make sure you're paying attention to this and watching for this, especially if you have users who are using box.com. And the challenge with box.com that we continually see is that it is one of those that can creep into your environment without you being aware of it. So uh, because it becomes a shadow IT type of thing where users just go out and set up their own account and they may or may not be aware of these types of vulnerabilities. So scanning your environment for usage of box.com or flat out blocking access uh, to box.com through your organization unless you actually have a uh, controlled version of it through your IT group and your security team has reviewed it would be a good recommendation on that. <coughs> um, more patching available on Zoho. Uh, I, I giggle a lot because it, it's a patch available for a patch management system. Um, but uh, their managed engine has had some challenges over the last uh, month or two, and they have a patch available out there. So if you are running managed engine, make sure that you're getting those latest patches of, uh, deployed out there. Um, a new uh, comment from Salesforce is that they're going to actually start mandating MFA by default. Um, which is great news. Uh, this will dramatically uh, reduce the number of uh, um, compromises led by uh, default credentials or uh, stolen credentials, credential stuffing type attacks on the Salesforce platform because it will have MFA out of the gate. Um, CISA has... It, please, please leverage your CISA site. They have so many, uh, they're really getting good at getting these alerts out quickly. Um, and they're publishing a lot of uh, different uh, exploited vulnerabilities on their site. So you can review those. I highly recommend that it be part of, if not your daily, at least a weekly review of what's going on out there. Um, go to their site, review them, see what's happening. Uh, we are seeing, you know, as, as geopolitical uh, incidents develop here, especially around Russia and uh, Ukraine, uh, <clears throat> we fully anticipate that there will be an increase in uh, attacks on U.S. critical infrastructure, especially if we actually have a role in, uh, in that theater of operations where we actually start to uh, push back on the Russians and prevent them. We they have already threatened to attack or retaliate on uh, U.S. interests, and uh, the federal government is releasing warnings on critical infrastructure. So make sure that you are paying particular attention to any of your platforms and abnormalities, and respond quickly if you are in that critical infrastructure space. Um, one of the things that we're actually also seeing is uh, we're seeing that public cloud services, whether it's AWS or Azure, are actually being used to deliver um, uh, rats. And, uh, you know, this, this comes back to a challenge that we've been seeing for quite some time, which is uh, everyone wants to move to the cloud and take advantage of the use and the ability availability of this resource. However, we need to remind everyone that, you know, this is just someone else's computer. You're putting your data on someone else's computer and there are certain requirements that you have to do as a responsible uh, steward of this information to make sure that you are actually protecting 
that information which is entrusted to you even when you put it out on these sites. So making sure that you're going through your tenant and you're setting up all the security uh, controls effectively and you're turning off any services that are not needed. It's just the same as if you're running it in your environment. You need to be making sure that you are turning these services down and that you're protecting yourself appropriately out there to prevent these types of attacks. <clears throat> um, and we're, we're also seeing uh, on these misconfigured uh, uh, tenants out there that uh, crypto miners are actually leveraging these gaps to actually steal uh, time slices on your uh, tenant. And you may be presented with a very large uh, bill if you don't have some basic settings. There are uh, email alerts that you can set up that uh, trigger on consumption in your uh, AWS and Azure tenants. And we highly recommend turning those on so that if someone is actually stealing your cycles there, that you're alerted quickly before it becomes a real problem and you're able to turn these services down. Uh, so <clears throat> as Tim had alluded to in the very beginning, we definitely always want to give uh, a nod to the, uh, the federal agencies who are doing an admirable job of trying to get in front of this. Uh, we've seen the FBI trace and uh, pull back a $150 million theft of Bitcoin. We've seen them uh, uncover some operations that were actually leading to financial thefts. Uh, we also saw a couple of, uh, a married couple in, uh, I believe it was the Ukraine that were actually arrested and they were actually a huge uh, uh, source of a lot of, uh, ransomware in the region and uh, they actually have arrested them and taken them down. So, you know, we're seeing positives in this. It's not all doom and gloom. Uh, and we always like to recognize that. And uh, we're not sure if it's actually simply a geopolitical move or not, but the Russians actually did participate in the takedown of Rebel, um, which is really unprecedented to see them engaging in a uh, Russian APT group takedown. So um, for whatever reason, we're thankful that they have actually participated in that. And, uh, you know, hopefully that will continue over time. So I'd like to spend a couple of minutes here and just talk about what we expect to see in 2020. These are the, these are the trends of where we, we think you need to really watch because these are going to be the threat vectors and uh, security challenges that we're going to see over the next uh, 12 months. Ransomware, absolutely going to continue. We're seeing the ransomware groups becoming more and more refined. It is big business. As I said, they're diving into the um, the access broker business where they're leveraging with them. They've got their entire affiliate networks and they're leveraging them. They're getting more sophisticated. We're seeing the complexity of the ransomware increasing uh, where it actually is the double extortion, triple extortion. Yeah, and 37% of businesses were impacted by ransomware last year. So it, it's no small number there, especially when you consider that <clears throat> the average was about 200,000 uh, in uh, ransomware impact, but we saw as high as uh, 41 million in ransomware payout last year. Um, we're seeing supply chain attacks continue. Uh, we saw in the uh, open source uh, supply chain, we're seeing a 650% increase in uh, attacks in that space. And, and that, like I said before about the uh, Log4j is a real challenge because there's not a dedicated team to really go attack this and, uh, and stop it quickly. So we're relying on these volunteers to put in these superhuman efforts to go out there and fix the holes in this because it is uh, a community effort in the open source world, but we expect that it's going to be continuing in the uh, in the commercial sector as well because it's the efficacy of the attack for the APT groups once they actually have this, you know, it's that one to many relationship. They're able to attack one vendor, have that deployed to thousands of customers, and then they can leverage those attacks and back doors for time to come. Cyber insurance started to develop as a real challenge over the last year. 
we saw the uh, cyber insurance carriers being hammered by the ransomware payouts um, and also the uh, number of breaches. And they are really locking down now on the uh, underwriting and they are requiring a lot of new security controls be in place and validated before they'll even underwrite. <coughs> and it's also driven premiums through the roof. So we expect that to continue this year as well and will uh, become more and more of a challenge for a lot of organizations who don't necessarily have a formal program uh, in place to really even start to renew their insurance. Um, third party risk is a continuous challenge as well. Um, we, we see this as a real target for a lot of organizations where you may be a small organization, but you have connections into a larger, more attractive target for some of these threat actors. They'll go after the weaknesses in your environment and work upstream. So you have a responsibility to have a good program in place to protect your partners. But then also from the other perspective, you want to make sure that if you have partners that they're doing the job that they're supposed to be doing as well because that's going to become a challenge. Um, you know, and 44% of companies who were surveyed by Poneman during a study this past year actually uh, said that over the past 12 months, 74% of the uh, breaches they had were result of uh, third parties with uh, privileged access. So, you know, it, it's a real challenge. Make sure you know what your third parties have access to and that you're controlling it effectively and that you're asking them and auditing them for what they're doing to protect your information as well. Um, so critical infrastructure, I think I've talked about that. We expect that to continue to develop. We're seeing an increase in uh, the amount of uh, nation state activity um, and critical infrastructure is absolutely one of the primary targets. Uh, that actually ties back up to third party risk because they do use third party vendors. So if you're a third party working with critical infrastructure, please make sure that you're doing everything required. Uh, we're seeing changing in regulatory environment. Just this morning, I read another article of <coughs> the Biden administration pushing for uh, zero trust in all federal platforms by the end of 2024 uh, to increase the uh, the hardening of their networks and limiting the access uh, there. So we expect that to continue to develop. China has instituted some new policies. The EU have implemented some new policies. So, um, you know, governments are starting to catch on that they have a role in this, especially from protecting the governmental systems. And hopefully that we can actually see a, uh, a partnership, an increased partnership with some of these uh, governmental entities. Um, IoT is everywhere. It's a rapidly increasing market. Uh, we see thousands and thousands of devices being deployed out there. And unfortunately, <coughs> partially because of <coughs> speed to market, partially because the devices are thin themselves and don't have the ability to carry a lot of security controls. Uh, there's a lot of risk associated with IoT vulnerabilities and they can be exploited quickly. We expect to see attacks on these, whether it's in the home space and residential space with the nests and the rings or in medical devices where they're actually using patient devices that potentially create a human risk factor as well. Um, we, we expect to see these continue. The, um, the, the uh, industrial control systems are going to be under attack. Manufacturing is going to be under attack. Manufacturing was the leading uh, sector for denial of service attacks over the past year. So um, we think that will continue as well. And that affects our supply chain, which affects our economy. Some of these uh, cyber vulnerabilities are starting to roll into uh, real effects in the uh, non-cyber world. Um, we also, as we talked about, see cloud service vulnerabilities. Everyone is moving to the cloud. Everyone is deploying their applications out there. We really, really need to focus on that and make sure that we're doing our job on staying in front of uh, these types of uh, activities um, and how we're configuring our cloud uh, environments and not just treat them as someplace that offloads our workload so we don't have to worry about running them in our shops. 
Um, and then finally, insider risk. Uh, we are seeing a trend, and we've actually worked on a couple of uh, incidents where insiders were, they were contract insiders who were actually then subcontracting their work efforts out to other uh, contractors. And this potentially creates a breach, especially in the healthcare space where they may have access to PHI data without having the appropriate controls around it. And understanding what your inside users are doing and understanding what their normal behaviors are so you can see what that looks like when they are actually having abnormal behaviors becomes very important as well. Um, so all of this being said, we're always going to come back to what we believe is the appropriate response to this, and that's defense in depth. You know, there are a lot of different specific uh, uh, attack vectors that we see out there, you know, whether it's the email phishing, whether it's ransomware, whether it's drive-by downloads, whether you're they're attacking a uh, unpatched vulnerability. But... <coughs> excuse me, the best way for your organization to protect itself is through this defense in depth architecture. Making sure that you've got good intelligence sources, making sure that you're putting the proper tools on your perimeter to limit access and that you're shutting down services on that outside edge, that you're deploying network defenses to identify these attacks as they come through your environment and that you're deploying tools like uh, uh, user behavior analysis tools and SIMs and SOCs that are going to be able to monitor across this types of uh, uh, activities and that you've got endpoint defenses. You know, the one of the primary uh, attack uh, segments when a ransomware vendor comes in is they go after the endpoint defense. One of our recommendations is don't just run one. Make sure you're running more than one endpoint protection on these devices so that if one is triggered, the other one will alert. Um, and that can be as simple in smaller organizations as make sure you turn on Windows Defender and then have a good EDR platform running on there so that there's a potential that they're going to pick up on each other and have that intelligent overlap there to see when an attack is occurring. And then, you know, make sure that you're protecting your data itself. Make sure that it can't be easily exfiltrated, that you've got data loss prevention strategies and you understand what data you're protecting. You know, what are your critical assets? Where do they sit and how do they flow? And that you can respond efficiently and effectively to these. You know, a, a well thought out response program that actually has been drilled and tested is very important to make sure that you actually have the ability and the team trained to respond quickly to limit the attack, isolate and contain the uh, attackers and uh, get them off your network before they can uh, further damage your environment. So Tim, I'm gonna hand it back over to you for some discussion here. Sure. Thank you, Skeet. <clears throat> Thank you, Kenneth. A lot of great information. Um, yeah, I know we're 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 beyond our normal time, but you know, we, we had some real important information today. And, and <coughs> I'm going to invite you to go ahead and, and uh, remind you, if you've got a question, drop it in the Q&A bucket at the bottom. Uh, we'll, we'll grab those. I'm going to work through some of these questions that we've got coming in. So feel free to drop a question in. We'll, we'll work through these. And just if you need to go feel free don't don't you know we we hope you can hang around remember we'll, we'll capture capture the answers in in the uh recording and we'll distribute that but let me start here skeet here's one question kind of go back to the, the beginning is i've had a vendor tell me they can scan and remediate the log 4j issues in my environment what am i not understanding or what questions do i need to ask uh so great question and kenneth i'll let you comment on this as well uh the first thing that I will say is, you know, we want to patch and we want to patch quickly, but we have to patch safely as well. Um, you know, creating a downtime and outage because you patch quickly and don't understand the ramifications of it can be just as detrimental. Um, making sure that you know what systems you are remediating quickly because they don't have an impact, get it off of your network as much as possible. But also, I, I think when you're patching like this, it can also be about reducing exposure. 
It doesn't necessarily have to be just the vendor patch. If it's something you can take the Java completely off the platform, take it off. If it's something that you can block a service port or disable access from different segments of your environment, you have also limited your exposure. Kenneth, I'll let you kind of hop on on that one as well. No, you're absolutely right. Creating uh, the culture of uh, planned outages is a is one is perfect. Uh, that's exactly what you need to do. But also asking your the vendor, how are you planning on doing this? And if they state anything other than uh, putting in some sort of control metric, uh, as Steve was talking about, a block or uh, some sort of alerting, but then also not a patching scheme, then. Uh, then I would really start having some doubts as to what they're going to do. But also uh, reach out and have a, a checks and balances. Uh, I always suggest getting uh, uh, another, another uh, vendor to answer and to ask the question as well, because you never know what one engineer believes versus the other. Yep. Thank you guys. Hey, we'll keep moving through the questions here. Uh, um, reading them off here how popular are s bombs my vendor my vendors don't supply them and when i ask i get crickets do you see more vendors producing s bombs so and maybe uh, we define uh, s bomb what s bomb is again <laughs> uh skid I, I, i'll address this one real quick uh, yeah we, we see a lot of it in the uh healthcare industry okay. anything that's a public application uh, a great example of that would be any medical devices that are on the market uh, they're required by the FDA to provide an S-bomb. Uh, as far as any other industry, uh, this is a fairly new one to start coming out. Um, and only over, over the next few years, uh, especially within medical, uh, the Biden administration actually made it mandatory to have an S-bomb upon release. So this is becoming a, a normal platform. Yeah, and I, that's what, where I was going to go as well, Kenneth. I, I think in some industries, it's an expected uh, behavior. In others, it's new to them and they're not good at it. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is don't forget that you've got internal applications as well. So internally, it's going to be, have to become a practice as well of getting your developers to tell you what they're using in their environments. We see this quite a bit in our clients where, you know, all of a sudden you find out that the developers are using some utility in an application and it hasn't been approved or it hasn't been tested. You don't understand the vulnerabilities associated with it. So, you know, not just is it going to have to be a, de a developing behavior in the broader market, but I think it's also going to have to be something that internally we start to stress uh, that we need to be more disciplined about developing them on our internal applications as well. Absolutely. And just to expand and there, I'm sorry, quick, you know. Uh, whenever we're thinking about just programming in general, the uh, I, I always want to go back to Android and Apple. You may pull in the entire Google Android library, uh, which has hundreds, if not thousands, of different components, but you may not need all of them. So really educating developers on best practices of not pulling in libraries, components that you do not need. Log4j is a great example of that. Uh, the entire Java library being brought in whenever the Log4j service, the web shell, is not utilized. Uh, understanding what you were bringing into our applications and what risk. You can run an SBOM uh, OSA uh, open source analysis on anything. Anything that's on GitHub, you can run this. Um, uh, we, we can demonstrate this very easily of uh, downloading anything such as like... Uh, um, Sonar, which is a uh, TV uh, repository, and demonstrate how we can now uh, verify direct dependencies, but also indirect dependencies. And understanding that a direct dependency <coughs> is great, understanding that is, is, is uh, fantastic, but what does that dependency bring in uh, after the fact from a transitive yeah. side? Uh, that's other information that is, is valuable. And just in clarification, would some of those acronyms, maybe you just give us real quick, remind us what an S-BOM is and uh, what that acronym stands for. 
Absolutely. Uh, the SBOM is software bill of material. It is exactly what it uh, sounds like. Uh, it is a list of all of the pieces and components that make up the application. A great example of that would be uh, a car. Uh, you, you have your main component, such as, we'll say, an engine. Well, then you can break that down even further. You have the headers. You have uh, different injection ports. It's no different with software. You have Java, you have Log4J that's specific with it. You have Kafka. You have different other repositories that are involved in an application. Thanks. And then OSA. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. Yeah. And OSA is uh, open source analysis. So it is the actual uh, scanning of open source tools. Very good. Thanks, Kenna. Great explanation Absolutely. there. Uh, let's keep working down through our questions. You got, uh, do you have any um, best practices for the ransomware rapid insertion team. My name's Keith. I know you talked about that. Um, maybe you can expand on that a little more. Yeah, I, I think it becomes, you know, first off, you need to know who's on the team. <laughs> what What's their role? What are their skills? And then you need to make sure you have a clearly defined playbook. You know, <clears throat> and part of that playbook needs to be the authority to act quickly. You don't, you may need to take an entire service offline to prevent the spread. Um, and you don't want to have to be sifting through executive approvals. This needs to be something that is pre-planned and has already been authorized that if necessary, that team can act to prevent the uh, spread of this attack. You know, it's, it's triage in the first few minutes to actually save the patient and uh, that you you can't be fumbling around with global approvals in those scenarios because it will ultimately end up failing so I, I think for me those are kind of the three things know that you've got the team defined and it's got the right members on the team that you've got the right people to do the job that they have a clearly defined playbook and they have the authority to act that's great. One thing I might add to that too, just just as as you think about the team members, is that if you've got multiple r remote locations that you know you've got you've got team members that are could be on site if need to to scale that that response. Yep, absolutely, and that they've got the communications protocols as well. Yes, absolutely, and making um, sure your culture is built for that. Uh, understanding that security, it may be a tricky moment, but this culture of everyone concern for security is, is crucial. <laughs> yep. And I've got a just a, a question here, a request. Can you share a link to the CISA Exploited Vulnerabilities Catalog? So just a note to everyone, we'll, we'll place that link in, in our communication uh, uh, as it goes out with the recording. So so look for that information there. Uh, let's see, what other questions do we have? Oh, here we go. Skeet, you mentioned Git pool, it's a, it, and the question is, is Git pool just a log4j discovery tool, or no. can maybe you expand on what that is, and, and also the spelling of that? <laughs> yes, it, it's, uh, so Git pool is G-Y-T-P-O-L, uh, based out of Israel, and they are a, they monitor your endpoint devices to look for uh, misconfigurations. And those misconfigurations can be anything from a, uh, a setting that was not set on an endpoint correctly or a group policy that did not get pushed out or a lack of uh, reduction of services based on your policy. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it looks at a variety of different ones, and one of the advantages is that it is not uh, network specific. It can look at these devices wherever they are, whenever they are, because it is uh, cloud-based capable, and it will look out there and find these devices, uh, tell you where the gaps are, and then, you know, in the case of a log4j on these endpoints, you can then authorize it to remediate uh, on a one-button push for the devices that you want it to remediate on. So it it's a very effective tool in managing what I consider to be the gap in our vulnerability management tool suites. When you look at Tenable IO or Nessus or a uh, Qualys, they are fantastic at going out there and understanding your common risks. 
uh, based on a uh, missing patch or a defined vulnerability based on a CVE that's out there. They don't necessarily identify when there might be a missing, uh, like a default credential or a policy that did not get accepted by an end user. So that can be very critical because if the policy is a USB usage and it didn't get uh, accepted by the uh, in, in device, then you've got a device out there that can accept a USB, you potentially have that user put it in there, and you've got an entry point for ransomware into your environment or malware into your environment. So uh, it, it's a great complementary tool to other platforms out there like your vulnerability management tools. Great insights, Keith. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking, I think that's the end of our questions for today. Um, we'll just do a quick wrap. Thank you guys for, for, uh, for being a part of, a, of, the, of the kickoff session for 2022. As a reminder, we'll do these on the last Wednesday of each month, uh, noon Eastern time, 11 Central. Uh, so look for um, email communication throughout the month. We'll, 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 um, we'll keep you reminded and the ability to register and make sure you're, you're attending. Um, again, feel free to reach out to us. We're on LinkedIn. Our contact information here is on the screen. Uh, and you'll see it too in the recording. Feel free to reach out to us, connect on LinkedIn. Uh, we love to get to know uh, our leadership community out there. And again, we're, we're, we're so grateful for you being a part of, of uh, the, the CDI uh, security briefings every month. So look for more to come. We'll, uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.